Hey, what's up, everybody? What's up, everybody? I am sitting down with Brian Hale again. Uh, for those of you that are new to the community, Brian has been a CEO of multiple companies over a long period of time. He's been a head of production. Uh, early on in his career, he was one of America's you know all-time top mortgage professionals. So he really has a great perspective of every seat on the bus in mortgage. Uh, today, he is consulting and advising CEOs, uh, leadership teams. Uh, he's involved in many of the M and A activities happening in the in the mortgage industry right now. So, so Brian, it's good to have you. I appreciate you making time to lean into this community and tell us tell us what you think is important to know. Well, first of all, thanks, Dave. I always uh, appreciate my opportunity to chat with you and your community. So, uh, again, just appreciate the opportunity to be on with you. So. Um, Boy, what is there to know? There's a lot to know and maybe not a lot to know, depending on your perspective on this. I think trying to remember what date it was that uh, the last time we chatted, but it was maybe just a touch over a month ago. And uh, as you are aware, you know, a month in our business is, in my view, generally equivalent to about three years in most businesses. Things are moving fast out there. So let's just pick up maybe where we were. I think the last time we chatted, uh, we we kind of coined the term light at the end of the tunnel as part of our conversation. And I tried to make the case that the light at the end of the tunnel was not a train coming the other way, right? And uh, right. and a big part of that is interest rates, what was going on in the marketplace. And if you looked at the end of November and most of the beginning of December, we saw a very material improvement in the bond market and in interest rates. And we started, you know, I mean, literally we got a hundred plus basis point relief in mortgage rates, what seemed like almost overnight. It wasn't, it was over a four to six week period of time and kind of bounced along, but we got this, this pop that was, you know, I think exciting many, right? We started seeing mortgage interest rates in the mid to maybe upper sixes, uh, where just six weeks before that we were up in the touching eights and maybe people were worried that we were going to see eight and a half or, or higher, which I think would have been devastating uh, to the market. And, and clearly, by the way, you know, this is, I think, our first chat uh, in the new, in the new year is, you know, I'm not disappointed to see 2023 uh, behind us. I'm sure most of the industry feels the same way. It's a very difficult period of time. That said, um, so then what's happened? So obviously the holidays happened um, and then the world came back. And so as a quick catch up from where we were. You know, as of this morning, just about 20 minutes ago, the 10 year was at 410. Uh, it finished the week last year up in the teens at 416, 417. Notably, we had dropped into the low 3.8 range uh, just prior to the end of the year. So we've lost some significant ground here, uh, which has been my view all along, Dave, that I still am in the camp. I'm still bullish on 24, wildly bullish on 25. And by bullish on 24, I simply mean that I still believe, and I I try not to forecast specific interest rate moves or levels because I think it's a fool's errand to some degree. But I, I believe that through the balance of 24, we're going to see materially lower interest rates uh, than we have today. But it's also my view that they may not be low enough through the bulk of this year to materially move the market, uh, owing to nobody really knows what the Fed's going to do here at, at the end of the day. So. So what's happened? So a couple of things have happened. Clearly, the thing that's maybe the most, uh, two things that are most pressing on the market. Last week, we had a series of treasury auctions that were at um, like pandemic level highs, meaning the amount of uh, debt that the US government had to push into the marketplace was very high, uh, having to refund and fund the US government and some of those auctions did not go particularly well. The bid ask issue in the dealer community was not great. And I don't want to sound like a junior economist here, but the short version is we're pushing mortgage backed securities into the market. The US government is pushing US Treasury debt into the market. All things being equal, people will buy Treasury debt over mortgage backed securities by way of security, uh, you know, from a safety and soundness standpoint. So we get crowded out when that happens. So we lost some ground. Secondly, you know, if people are paying attention to the news, the Middle East is on fire. Um, and with over the weekend, we tragically saw some loss of life of U.S. service people um, that, you know, suggests that we could have a broader conflict here 
I hope not, but I'm not, you know, I don't want to get into the politics of it. Here's the short version. Anytime there's a risk to oil and the free flow of oil through the Red Sea and other areas in the Middle East, uh, we see oil prices begin to tick up. Oil prices are at shockingly low levels, to be honest, from where people were predicting maybe a year ago. Uh, it's been down at the $70 a barrel or give or take. We've lost some ground in the price of oil. If the war were to expand, I worry that um, you know supplies will be threatened and price will go up uh, as a result, which is inflationary. So that's where this whole thing ends, right? Um, anything that creates inflationary pressure likely has a detrimental impact on our interest rates. And as I've been saying, frankly, for 18 months, as rates began to crest and begin to come back down the other side, which I think we're in that down the other side phase, we're not going to go in a straight line. And I, my message to your to your community would be, you have to be very thoughtful. And I think you want to be very cautious about telling people, look, refis, you know, or, or you're not going to lock today because I think rates are going to be lower. You know, one missile strike, one sunk oil tanker, one whatever could materially reverse the market. And my advice, if I was advising you, Dave, you were buying a house today and you asked me, hey, should I lock or not lock? Should I float? Should I do whatever? My answer would be if you like the price and you're comfortable with the number, lock, right? Because it's a hedge, you know, against what bad things could go on in the marketplace. So we've got a bunch of data coming out this week. And so let me talk to that in a second, but let me ask answer whatever question you may have on this point. My point is we're gonna have a bumpy ride to I think all of 24, and it's gonna be somewhat unpredictable. I think long term we get lower rates, maybe materially lower rates, but it's not all going to go in a straight line. So Dave, you had a, you had a question or a comment. Yeah. yeah. I want to just make a coaching note to everyone listening. And, and this is going to be the case all year. Just like last year, we, you needed to be really good at showing families options like, Hey, here's what rates are at showing them an affordability strategy, which is could be a two, one buy down three, two buy down seller concession buy down. And then you always need to still this year, like, Hey, let's lock this in. Let's get you into this home. And you can refinance and show, you know, if, if rates are at six and a half, show a five and a half option. So the more you can give that consumer, you know, clarity and confidence, you can buy today and and we can refinance. And if they're like, well, maybe I should wait. Well, ask them, what, what do you think is going to happen to values if you wait uh, and rates come down? Oh, you think it'll be harder to get your offer accepted and harder to, and prices will go up? Like, and then show them that like, well, hey, let's say you waited and rates came down a half and values went up, whatever their number is, show them the cost of waiting, you know? Yeah. So so being that advisor that helps a consumer put their assumptions and their, their thoughts on the market clear in writing with options, like has never been more valuable. So make yeah. sure you guys are doing that all year long. David, David, at the risk of sounding like I'm just harping on you and your brand, the shirt you're wearing, be a mortgage coach. I mean, Ooh. that's really the deal, right? And data-driven think, mortgage coach. Data-driven data -driven mortgage coach, but also because you can't tell, nobody can tell me today what rates are going to be in April, right? I mean, it's just not, yeah. it's just not rational. I think they'll be lower, but exactly, I have no idea. And so the short version is, Look, the tools that you produce, Dave, and that many of your community use are exactly right. You know, all the data that I've seen in the last 10 days suggests that real estate values will likely be up four to six percent this year in the US, when a lot of people were suggesting maybe this year you'd see a, a somewhat of a leveling out or potentially even a drop. I don't think so because we still have an inventory problem. So your comment and your advice on that is dead on. Look, had you had you locked in mid-December your rates would be maturely lower than they are today. So if you're not locking today, you take that risk. It's a hedge. Secondly, I think most, if not many companies, have some form of a float down structure with the buyer, right, in terms of being able to unlock and relock if things happen. And then third, to your point, whether it's a buy down or some other strategy, the idea that somehow you get a better deal by waiting, you can get a better deal by waiting. What you do, it's called a refi, right, to your point. And you now have another opportunity with that same consumer later this year or early next year or whenever it may happen. So dead on. So long and short, we have three really big numbers coming out this week that I think have a, have a chance of moving the market. But as we've seen over the last couple of weeks, these numbers could be contrary to each other. We have the JOLTS data coming out tomorrow, which is the job openings data. 
uh, that comes out, gives us a little sense of how many jobs are open versus people that are looking for a job. Secondly, I think on uh, on Thursday, we get the uh, jobless claims from the government. On Wednesday, we get the ADP jobs claims or you know unemployment numbers, the private sector view through ADP. And then on Friday, probably the most significant number we'll have this month and this um, this week, certainly, we'll see January unemployment data and, and, and uh, job creation data from the U.S. government on Friday morning. Um, and so depending on where those numbers come out, may forecast kind of our direction over the next month or so. Uh, but again, you could have two numbers come out strong, being inflationary, and two numbers come out being um, disinflationary, and they could cancel each other out. In short, the big number on Friday, there's an expectation right now, the forecast is 173,000 new jobs created compared to last month at 216. If that number comes in well above 173, we could see some sell-off in the market, being that the employment market is still too strong for the Fed states. And secondly, which just means they delay any moves they make to later in the year. Or if we get 173 or less, I'm still waiting. I think we're going to see a month here that comes in really low or maybe zero, right? Or even negative. And if we see that, you're going to get a hell of a move in interest rates in a hurry. So you should be prepared. And Dave, to your point, back to your mortgage coach, you know, you can't take an app and lock somebody in and say, I've done my job. You got to stay in touch with that customer. You got to be helping them through this. You got to be giving them data. You got to be thinking about how to, how to coach your customer. I don't mean in a negative way, in a very positive way to make sure that they're fully informed, educated, and have the knowledge to uh, make the right decisions as they go through this home ownership uh, journey. So, yeah, yeah, so that's what I do, Dave. That's, uh, I think we're going to be a little herky jerky here early in the year. And then the big question is, you know, when and how many rate reductions the Fed may do in 24. I've heard numbers from three to six. I've heard them, you know, March, I've heard May, I've heard June. I don't know. And I just, uh, there's so much going on in the world that could change all of that. Um, and we're in an election year. So hold that as a third variable that nobody can really predict. So a so, couple takeaways, a couple coaching points, and then I have a couple of questions I want to ask. So I love that little opening statement that, you know, the more one year in the mortgage business is like three years in most industries. Uh, one, uh, one month. One month. <laughs> well, <laughs> Yeah, but because it is, you know, we've got yeah. macroeconomic changes. We have, you know, kind of micro changes in our local markets. And I like to put things into uncontrollable and controllable. And so a lot of what Brian shared were, you know, they're good updates. And it's important for a mortgage professional to know this information so that you can be the lighthouse to your realtors, to your builders, to your borrowers. You know, the more you understand what's happening in the market, uh, the better of a leader that you could be for these folks. But at the end of the day, you know, asking great questions, understanding the needs of your consumers, and then delivering them solutions to address their needs beyond the transaction. That's that's what you need to do. So, oh, can, did I, you can, want to can, I, just, can I just add a quick comment to that, Dave? Yeah, please. I've been, I've been kind of harping on this on several groups that I've spoke to here recently. Um, I think if you're going to be in this business, you ought to consider yourself a professional, like an accountant, like a lawyer, like a doctor, right? I mean, if you think about those those professions, they typically have four to eight years worth of education. They have, you know, residency they go through, right? It takes them 10, 12 years to become one of those things. And then they have to act and they have a certain code of ethics, et cetera, et cetera. If you went to your accountant to get your taxes done and they did about 80% of the taxes and then handed it back to you and said, all right, you can finish it. It's not that complicated. Or are you went to a lawyer for a will and they did about a half of it, and then handed you a legal book and half done will and said, All right, you, why don't you finish it? Those things would be considered malpractice and you would never go back, right? Because it'd be unprofessional. I think in our business, we have an obligation to the consumer and to our clients that refer business to us to be a professional, which means educate yourself. Doesn't mean you have to know everything. It doesn't mean you have to have all the answers, but it's about helping your clients and your customers understand what questions to ask, how to think about it, give them data, help them make decisions, do those kinds of things. And you have an obligation to educate yourself and be as professional as you could otherwise expect other professionals to be to you. So that's my that's my soapbox for today. Um, but I think it's an important concept that uh, I think will separate true pros as we go forward from folks who probably are 
maybe more cling on to our business and are not really committed to the mortgage business. Yeah, no, I couldn't agree more. I I interviewed Phil Jones this morning, the author of Exactly What to Say. And one of the things we were talking about is like the ultimate touch point in the mortgage industry to optimize conversion and retention is the moment before the borrower has a need to be able to anticipate their needs and, and to be able to ask questions and then really help address those needs. And guys, you, you can control that. Hey, I, I've got a couple questions around um, some things I'm hearing in the C-suite and meetings that I'm having. And I meet with, we have banks as customers. We have independent mortgage bankers as customers. We're, we're seeing more of our IMBs have both the consumer direct group and retail, you know, hybrid groups trying to leverage each other. And there's a couple FTC, um, you know, what I'd call C shifts coming that I wanted to see if they're hitting your radar yet. So one of one of those is the upcoming shifts that are going to take place to the lead aggregators, where you know, like in the in the past, a borrower would fill out an online form with loan, you know, lending tree, and three or more lenders would get it at the same time. Jump, and, yeah, jump ball. And in the future, the borrower fills out. And for every lender that LendingTree is going to introduce, they need consent. Like they can't just one lead equals three or more leads. Um, I think that's going to have a real impact on the, you know, lead aggregation, um, lead business. Um, and then there's another FTC change. I want to ask you about that one. And then I want to go to the next one. How familiar are you on, about this and any thoughts you have on it? On the lead aggregator, I'm, I, let me just say this. I would say that I'm reasonably familiar with it. Look, I, I I don't know, you know, you and I and everybody out there are also consumers. And so, you know, my mailbox, by the way, I'm a do not solicit guy, right? I'm on the list. But I check my mailbox and I constantly get solicitations. Which somebody who's doing that is arguably violating California law, at least that's where I live, um, in the process. And so I think... It's like anything in our business, Dave, I worry that certain ideas that smart that start out as a smart, good idea, we have a tendency in our industry to then be a little bit crack addict-ish, where if, it, if it's good and it feels good, then we want to do more of it to the extreme, right? And so I think this whole lead thing, um, you know, from trigger leads to lead aggregators to whatever the case would be. And I don't, I don't besmirch anybody's business. Look, you know, the credit bureau guys want to sell trigger leads and the lead aggregators want to, you know, sell leads and God bless everybody to make a buck. You know, as an entrepreneur, I, I support everybody's, you know, effort to do that. That said, when you begin to do it in a way that becomes detrimental to the consumer and or to the industry, then I think, you know, what typically happens is regulation shows up or, you know, somebody gets pinged, you know, the privacy law we have here in California was driven by a state senator whose daughter, you know, wasn't treated well about their private information. And guess what? Now we have one of the most restrictive private information laws in the country as a result. And so you worry, I worry about these things that make our business harder at a time when it's already very hard. So I think, A, on the lead aggregator, I think that business First of all, there's some smart players in that space, and I think they'll try to figure out exactly how to do that. But gaining people's consent, you know, if, if you ask me, hey, Brian, I have your name, I have your information, I have your rate, and I want to sell this to three other companies, please consent here. The chance of you getting that from me, absent you paying me $10,000 is zero, <laughs> right? Because I don't, I don't want to get three phone calls. I don't want to get three more pieces of mail. I don't want to do those kinds of things. And I think that's where most people are at. Not all. Those who certainly people know the business well, maybe are there. And so I think it's going to have, it's going to put more pressure on originators and companies to develop their own lead sources in the process. Frankly, I think it might, as we begin to improve economically in the industry, I think it'll put more pressure on people retaining servicing so that they can stay in touch with their book of business and do the things that, you know, again, that a lot of your tools are focused on. Three, I think data and the ability to get to customers outside the lead aggregator business or other approaches, I think a premium on that approach goes up again. And so, and by the way, I think this is happening at a time where in the real estate space, many of our referral sources also have their own 
batch of problems with new lawsuits and I think regulation coming and rules coming around that piece, where I think many of those folks to offset some of the drop in commission value that they may see in the future are going to be in our space as an originator because of the changes in some of the rules that HUD put out last year, allowing people to earn commissions on two sides of the transaction and all that kind of stuff. So in short, Dave, on my point about a month is three years, there are so many changes and cross currents happening here simultaneously. And I think, I think this is going to make the business more difficult for the lead aggregators. I think it'll reduce the supply of leads in some cases, not all. And again, I think there's some smart folks on that side that I'm sure will try to figure out other ways to do this. But to the degree we keep doing the same thing at a point where it begins to annoy the consumer or others, I think we run the risk of having regulatory changes come at us that are not helpful to the business. So I don't know. Yeah. The takeaway there is, you know, don't because something feels good, don't do it over and over again to the point where you annoy the customer. Yeah. Well, one one more question. And then I want to share what I think is some best practice thinking in the market and get your feedback on this thinking. But, you know, another um, FTC legislation that's coming down on do not call list is is that um, when you do marketing, this could be you as a lender and you get a lead, whether you got it through an aggregator, you did it through direct mail, you did it through some any type of marketing, you, in the past, you got that information and you can just keep calling that person. And now the FTC is coming up with some regulations that you can't call them 90 days after the lead came. And kind of my take on that is that is good for the consumer. The more we're not noise and the more that you can be signal for the consumer, um, I, I get it. I support it. Have you, this is hot off the press. This is fairly new. Have you heard of this FTC? Yeah, I, I haven't heard it in final form. I heard some conversation around a proposed rule and I always hold out the, the possibility that, um, you know, some of the group off K Street and DC might have an impact on some of those final rules in terms of, uh, you know, folks who try to push different aspects of legislation. But that said, to the degree that that's there, look, I, I think if you all, I think all we have to do is look to Europe. Europe has some of the most stringent confidentiality rules around solicitation and those kinds of things. And I think it's coming our way. I think, I think because of tools that have evolved, People are less excited. I mean, we see it when I, I, I'm a Flipboard fan. And every time I read an article in Flipboard, I've got to acknowledge whether or not I want my cookies to be sent, whether I want, you know, solicitation, whether I want to be put on a list, whether I want to do all these things. In general, some I do because I want the information. Some I don't because I don't want the annoyance. And I just think it puts a big premium on that piece. It also, Dave, as I'm thinking about listening to you, I think it puts an immense premium on your first touch with the consumer. And some of the tools that you promote and use with your community, be professional, have something to say, and not just, hey, 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 you want to refi, you want to refi, you want to refi, you want to refi, you want to do, you know, want to whatever. To your point about constant follow up, I think you just become noise and the quality of your presentation, the quality of your value add, the quality of your first touch puts an immense premium on that side. A and B, I think you got to think about everybody else who's after that consumer. And I've I've seen some strategies there that I think can be pretty helpful to eliminate some of those other pieces and have the consumer focus with you as a good profession, so. Yeah, well, let me walk through a couple of slides and then get your thoughts. And always appreciate, Brian, you've been an incredible advocate for Trust Engine and Mortgage Coach. But, you know, th this is part of a presentation I'm doing this year called Obsessed with Impact. And, and, you know, as I said a minute ago, the ultimate touch point in conversion and retention is to get to the borrower, you know, a moment before they need, you know, be, be as predictive as you can. And you did give me a little layup, you know, like this really helps with mortgage coach, like, don't, you know, like this, this, this is what a consumer needs to do a transaction, your rate, your payment, and your cash to close. But this is not what the consumer needs to make an informed decision that's going to help them with sustainable homeownership and help them build wealth with real estate. They really need more information. Um, and then Brian, this is kind of speaking to the point where, you know, before trigger leads, 
this is what every lender and loan officer's database looks like. Like they did not have any context. And, and then, you know, sales boomerang came around and other solutions, you know, but here's, here's what all these things have in common, you know, a listing alert an inquiry alert guys. They're like in the market. They already happened. I mean, it best you're, you're 10th in line calling the consumer and you're starting to get to be noise. Like we need to get to the consumer in the sweet spot, you know, the, the, to be able to anticipate their needs and then be valuable. Like, and, and so Brian, one of my thesis is when you look at all this legislation that's taking place, it, it puts more value on the database and it puts more valuable on every company, as you said, being that data-driven mortgage coach. I think it also puts immense value on referrals from your past clients, right? You want to get a great lead, in my opinion, get my neighbor who just used you to refer you to me. That's way better than somebody calling me or sending me something out of the blue, right? And so, and I think there's a there's another aspect about this, uh, Dave, which is how do you educate that potential consumer, however you may have ended up talking to them, to be a better consumer and to recognize your professionalism versus less professionalism elsewhere that may help drive their decision to transact with you. And, you know, I've, we should talk about this offline, but I had this tool that I've talked to a lot of people about. Actually, like a lot of my best ideas, I stole it from somebody else, an originator who used to work for me, who's in his 80s, who's still in the business, who's still killing it every day. And way back when, he used to use this thing of 10 questions. And whenever he talked to a new lead, whether it was a referral from a realtor or builder or somebody he knew or however he got the lead, he would always send the consumer. He would say to him, look, I know that everybody else is going to be talking to you or you may reach out and talk to others about getting a mortgage. I got it. I understand that totally. One of my roles is to help educate you on how to be a better consumer of this business. Let me send you 10 questions that I think you should ask all of my competitors when you're trying to decide who you're going to do business with. And they were really complex questions like, could you explain to me how to calculate a maximum loan amount on an FHA loan? Can you tell me on the back of my VA certificate of eligibility what the number means? Is that the amount of money I can borrow? Could you tell me how a margin and an index works on an arm loan to determine my rate in the future? Now, tragically, Dave, and look, you do a lot more business in the originator community than I do. I have a hypothesis that there's a very high percentage of originators who cannot answer those questions without putting the consumer on hold and going and asking somebody. And for this guy, he had about a 95% recap rate with those consumers. Once he sent it out, because he could answer all those questions like that, right? Once he sent it out, the consumer a day or two later would call back and go, he didn't call back and say, what's your rate today? They would call back and say, Tony, when can you come out to the house to talk to us, right? Because what he did is he helped the consumer identify that many of the people they were talking to were not really true professionals, were not really going to be the guide through the swamp of home ownership that he was going to be. Right. Game, set, match, over. Right. Then it wasn't about rate. It wasn't about his price. It was about, okay, we get it. We get it. We found the right guy. Could you come out and work with us? And so those little tools like that, I think those little thoughtful things and that first interaction are so critical. Uh, without regard to any of this regulation going on. And I think we're going to see a lot more regulation this year. You maybe saw this lawsuit, and I'm not going to name the two companies, but something made the press here recently, where one of our largest lenders is suing another lender, one for poaching, but also using this concept of lead determinate compensation. Oh, did this come from my realtor? Oh, did this come from my internet? Oh, is this a corporate lead? And I have a different comp structure around each one of those. One lender is accusing the other lender of violating the law and doing it in an incorrect way. I can tell you this from one of my clients who's just gone through a CFPB audit. This is one of their top topics that they're looking at is trying to understand, is that a BS way to do it? Is it a violation of the rules? And I think we could see, we could see somebody be made an example of, or we could see this show up in an awful lot of other audits this, this year. So <clears throat> again, as an industry, we have a tendency to find something that works, and then we try to do it to an re unreasonable, foolish level, and then we end up with regulation or rules or 
somebody writing a check for 50 million bucks because they did something wrong to the consumer. So I just would admonish everybody to pay attention to your point. Bring it yeah. this thing. Well, I've got one last question before I do that. I do want to add a question to that list of questions that you would give your customers that, Hey, you know, when shopping ask this and, and, and the question is make sure you ask every loan officer when they show you an option, what's the cost over five years Yes, and, and make sure you show yes. and they, and they show you the cost of different loans over five years and say yes. something to the effect that most loan lenders don't give the transparency of cost over time. And, and really that's how the best mortgage decisions are made. You know, the, the lending industry as a whole has APR and APR has some value, but most people don't have their home for 30 years. So APR, you know, it's based on total interest cost over 30 years. And, you know, you've told me, Mr. Jones, that five years is how long you think you'll have this home. So make sure the loan officer knows that. And by the way, unless the loan officer is a mortgage coach, they're going to be like, how do I do that? You know, like right. they're not right. like you're going to be putting them in a position. You're, of you're nailing it, Dave. Anything, in my view, that makes the other guys stumble in terms of <laughs> yeah, answering right. the question, you win. Right. And now, again, obligation on you to have those tools, have that knowledge, be able to answer all the questions. And by the way, you know, I have a list of 15 questions that I send out to people and say, look, pick 10, pick five. Or, you know, your market and you know who your primary competitors are make up a list of your own questions, right? That you know that a consumer should be asking in this process. And so I think I think those kinds of approaches, given the high premium, uh, and look, there's, we only did 4 million homes sold last year. We only did less than a trillion three as the industry. We're off 80% from the highs. Every lead opportunity is a premium and is worth its weight in gold if it's a legit lead. So how you interact at the front end, how you educate that consumer, how you not become noise and or worse than noise, annoying, right? Um, I think will prove to be exceptionally beneficial to originators here as we go forward. And so. All right. So I'm going to ask a question before I do that. So by the way, every executive that's listening to this branch manager that's listening to this, make sure you you stay and listen to this last question because I think this will be real valuable for Brian. But before I do that, Brian, I know you've got a newsletter. I, you know, if anyone's yeah. listening to this and they want to contact you or they want to get on your newsletter, what's the best way to follow you, well, get value from you? They can go up on my website of mortgageap.com. Uh, it's mortgage advisory partners, mortgageap.com. But Dave, we'll, we always provide you a link and uh, we have a QR code that we can provide you as part of this that you can publish down below as well. Uh, to your point, we have a weekly newsletter that comes out every Friday. By the way, I just want to be complete transparency. I don't write it. I publish it. I took some time and tried to find the right one that I think works for originators and branch managers. It's not written for capital markets people. It's not written for some Yahoo on Wall Street. It's written in a language and in a way that explains terms and concepts has a lot of good charts that you could use every week, every weekend to talk to consumers or your, your referral partners or whatever the case may be. Or if you're a branch manager, I think it's a great thing to educate yourself if you're doing a sales meeting with your with your team. So it's free, so you can't beat the price. Uh, subscriptions have been going through the roof. We publish it on Fridays to our subscription base, and it comes out on Monday in my LinkedIn and other social media pieces every week with a video of me over the top. That's not the value add, I can assure you. Uh, the value add is the newsletter. And uh, so you can click on the link, subscribe to it. It's free. Um, and subscriptions have just been going through the roof. We're adding subscriptions at like a 2,400 people every two month level going forward. So um, to the degree you find it valuable, great. If not, it doesn't cost you anything. You can cancel anytime. So you can't beat the price. All right. Check it out. It's down below. So here's Thanks, my, my last question. So I am... Um... I've upgraded our 10X. It's, you know, trustengine.com forward slash 10X to be a tool for branch managers and regional leaders who want to turn their loan officers into data-driven mortgage coaches. So I'm I'm trying to more and more create content specifically for that producing branch manager because I feel like that is the tip of the spur spear of change and of success. 
And so I want you to answer this question for branch managers. Uh, for all you branch managers and regionals listening, I mean, Brian was the head of production for Countrywide, which is one of the largest sales forces in the history of the mortgage industry. He's mentored more CEOs and heads of production than practically anybody, uh, maybe anybody. Brian would say anybody. Uh, but what advice do you have to them right now? Like we're in the last week of January. We're going into the first week of February this week. Uh, what what themes should they be doing in their sales meetings? Like if you were giving a theme for a branch manager at this time of the year, what are some of the themes and some of the, the topics they should great be covering? Question. Yeah. So first of all, um, a great question. Um Look, I think one of our challenges in our industry is that many folks who wear the label branch managers, it's really more of a compensation structure than an actual job, meaning that they were put onto a P&L and may or may not have some folks working for them. So first of all, I, I think if you're, a, if you're a true branch manager where you have people reporting and looking up to you for help and assistance, I think what the industry has migrated to where I think... 90 plus percent of branch managers today in our industry are producing branch managers. There was a time in my career where it was the opposite direction. There were very few producing branch managers and most of them were non-producing branch managers who were coaches and other kinds of folks. But for whatever combination of reasons, the industry has migrated this path. That said, if you're a branch, true branch manager, you have people looking to you, then I encourage you to have a meeting. Start there, right? To your point, Dave. Uh, I think that's that's job weekly, one. Weekly, right? Weekly meetings? Yes, weekly. Yeah, uh, weekly. Look, when I, when I started in the business, my, the guy that I worked for, it was daily at 7 a.m. every day in the office with some you know thoughts and concepts and pricing and product and, blah, 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 and a motivational you know video and a go get them, right? Kind of thing. I know times have changed. No, wait, wait. Time out. So Sean Bedosian, number one loan officer in the country, does meetings yeah, four times does. a week. Yeah. Daniel Saw, who I've interviewed twice, whose region of 40 loan officers averages five loans per month per loan officer last year yes. and became the, the number one lender beating out Rocket and Huntington Bank in Columbus, Ohio, to become the market share leader. Three meetings a week. You know, so so Just coaches, coaches and coaching. Yeah, coaches and coaching matter. It, exactly. And, and by the way, I'm going to put a link down below. I interviewed um, Daniel's VP of sales on like how, cause they, they kill it with trust digit. Like, like they use mortgage coach with everyone. They call on their data signals. They use their CRM. They use the point of sale, right? I interviewed him and uh, I'll put a link down below, but anyways, I go ahead and finish your thought. Right. On so, so, so first of all, do a meeting <laughs> weekly uh, or if you can't do a weekly, do it every other week. I mean, do a meeting. Right. Do a weekly that, meeting, period. Like, be weekly. If you're not doing weekly meetings, you're not yeah. doing best practices. I agree. And, and to your point, Dave, I think then there's more than just a formal meeting. I mean, where's the touch point? And you know, one of the things I used to like to do is just talk to everybody that reported to me every day. Just, hey, Dave, how you doing? Good, 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 great. The weather's bad? Okay, good talking to you. Boom, done, right? Just to get a touch point with that process. And I think particularly now in remote structures, it's even more important because we tend to lose touch with our remote friends because we're not seeing them at the water cooler or the coffee machine or whatever it used to be in the old days when I was an originator and woolly mammoths walked the face of the earth. And so that said, so if, if, if I was going to prioritize, I have one question for all sales leaders in the industry. Do you know who, who, specifically who, your sales force is calling on and what their origination strategies are for their top of funnel lead sources. And, and, and I have a lot of people go, oh yeah, 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 we know. No, they don't. No, they don't. Because once somebody's bringing in a million a month or 2 million a month or 800,000 a month or 4 million a month, they stop looking. They go, hey, Dave's got it. He's, why should I want to know? Well, because the real estate industry, and we've talked about this on previous interviews, Dave, the real estate industry is consolidating at a lightning pace to the top 10% of agents. There's 3 million plus real estate agents in the United States. There's about 300,000 that really matter, right? That are actually selling the vast majority. How, how many that matter? 
ten percent. But so, did you, what, what number did you say? Three hundred thousand. Okay, yeah, three hundred thousand. Yeah. You know, I'm just using round numbers. I'll be off by some factor, but in short, if your sales force, your rep who's working for you, is calling on some agents who are about to retire, whose business has gone away, who failed in social media, who don't drive leads to themselves, who are not part of a team that helps drive leads and has a disciplined approach, I have a simple view that those agents are about to be out of business. And with it goes your rep. And so one, do you know who they're calling on? And most importantly, why they're calling on them? What is that agent doing in terms of volume? Do you know? Do you know do your products match up to the type of sales volume that that particular agent's doing? I look at some markets like a Utah where house prices have skyrocketed over the last two or three years. And now somebody who is making a living as an originator doing FHA loans in Salt Lake home prices and their agents are operating at levels that don't use FHA anymore because of the loan size. Have you educated that person? So one, do you know who your people are calling on and why they're calling on them? And do you, what do you know about their referral sources as a coach to help that rep figure out how do I get from a million to 2 million, right? Because if they do that and you're on an override or you're on a p &L, it's all good for you but it takes someone to help coach. So that's number one. Number two, data, 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 right? Can you validate what someone is telling you? There's a lot of data sources out there. You need to have one. You need to use it in a smart way. And I think if you're an originator today and you're calling on the million five realtors in the bottom half of realtors in the United States, there's no loans. You could have the best product, the best approach, the best pitch, whatever the case may be. The industry is consolidating at a hyper rate to the top, to these big teams and other pieces. Most agents are remote today. You can't find them. You got to use data to identify them. Three, a disciplined approach. The very, what's your pitch, Dave? The very thing you were talking about before of your, you know, your five-year uh, cost analysis, your the form that you put up earlier in this interview. What is your approach? Is your approach to try to be better than Rocket, where you send them a link to your 1003, you give them a rate quote on the phone? Why you would do that is beyond me. It's just beyond me. Why you would answer the question of what is your rate? Why you would answer that question is beyond me. Because I think in many cases, when you say the number, you hear click because they've already heard a better price from somebody who may or may not be able to deliver the same value you can deliver. And so what is your sales approach? And I know Champ, I spent some time talking with him when I saw him down in Austin this year. He doesn't leave anything to chance for him, for his team or his originators. He knows what everybody is saying every day, right? And he coaches and he drills and he talks about it. And we look for best practices amongst his team. What his success is, is not magical. It's a process repeated over and over again, refined over and over again. And so I think at times today, Dave, because of the producing branch managers, people are busy working on their own book and their own referrals and saving their own skin and paying their own bills. And if the originator does some business, Oh, okay, I'll get a little override. Okay, that can be an approach. I think it's a terrible approach. I think it doesn't build your team. And I think a lot of people, if they're an originator in the Boston market, would love to go to work for Shant to get that kind of coaching. People need and want coaching. I just took one of my first mentoring clients. I generally don't do individual mentoring. This is at an executive sales leader level. Um and I would like to do more because I enjoy doing it. I just don't have the time to do it. So this particular person compelled me to do it. Um, but these are some of the concepts that we talked about, about how to, how to drive a sales force. Management, sales management is not a bad term. I think most many sales leaders don't like to be managed. Therefore, they don't manage their people because they think, well, if I was that guy or gal, I wouldn't want to have somebody 
checking in with me once a week and asking me how I'm doing and listening to how I'm approaching customers and those kinds of things. And I pay them a lot of commission. I pay them a lot of dollars. They should figure it out on their own. Okay. That's your strategy. That's not chance strategy or any of the other top producers that are out of there. They leave nothing to chance. And so it requires management, it requires ongoing interaction. So I don't forgive me for sounding a little soapbox this year, Dave, but. No, hey, I want to close on two things, you know, what, make sure you're following Brian on LinkedIn. I mean, he's just value on social media. Make sure you subscribe to his newsletter. Uh, make make sure that you you go to this. This is trustengine.com forward slash 10x. And, and we made this. Like, first of all, if you want to learn more about our data services, here's a demo button. If you're not a mortgage coach yet, you know, you can sign up here. But I made specific sales training. Like, out of all the interviews that I did last year, like, this is the, the six most valuable that you should watch. If you want to help your loan officers win with realtors, these are the six, you know, absolute top interviews I did to help you win. You I'm know, striving. I'm striving to get in that top six next year, dude. Well, I mean, th remember this is loan officer training, but by the way, maybe we should do a 10 X training with you. Yeah. Look, I'd and, be glad to. And, I, I'm and passionate about actually, this. this is one I'd love to do a repeat, you know, how to turn loan officers into mortgage coaches at scale so I, I actually put this one on every tap because this is this is Daniel Saw, um, his VP of sales for 40 loan officers. And and not only did they become the number one market share market share later last year, not only did they average five loans per month per loan officers last year, but they were the most profitable at NFM by 20 basis points. Of course. And, and it of course. was it was, you know, best practice sales training skills. And when a, and when a loan officer comes to work for them, you know, they, they, they do two weeks of training and they do two days of how to be a mortgage, or excuse me, three days, like three of those 10 days are all about how, how to actually be an advisor. So anyways, check out that resource. Brian, any closing thoughts, brother? Yeah, look, uh, just to tee off your last comment. So I think I mentioned this in one of the previous interviews we did. A couple of months ago, I got a chance in Phoenix with a client of mine to sit in a room for three days with 3,000 of the top 2% of real estate agents in the country, from all over the country. And these are all, for the most part, people who run big teams, you know, where they have 10, 12, 15 agents working for them. They had some panels, like, you know, any one of these kind of events. And on the panel, interesting to me, the change that they've gone through in the last 18 to 24 months as the market has become so difficult is there stop leaving anything to chance. If you're an agent and you go to work for one of those teams, here's what I heard from the panel that day. You come to work, we have a discipline. You're going to be on the phone six hours a day, calling new clients and prospecting. It's not five and a half hours. It's not five hours. It's, oh, by the way, I don't feel like it today. So I'm going to kind of check out and go get a coffee. You come on board. This is the deal. This is the discipline we operate on. This is our pitch. This is our sell. This is the follow-up mechanisms that we have. This is where it goes into the CRM. This is how we follow up our database. Not optional, not optional. You don't wanna do that? We're cool, please don't join our team, right? Because that's not our deal. Because they understand the value of having a plan, working the plan, having a pitch, having follow-up, refining it over time, rinse and repeat, rinse and repeat, rinse and repeat. Sales management is not a negative term. It helps people become, to grow their life, to grow their wealth, to grow their affluence, become a better professional, do those kinds of things. It's a value add. My my pitch, by the way, and I, I put one last piece. I don't know when it was that the industry decided that all originators should show up to work looking like they just came out of the gym. I think I think looking professional in the era of Zoom and Teams and other kinds of video interactions with your clients and your consumers and your customers and others, I feel, still think is a premium. I don't think you got to be a tie guy in a nine piece suit and whatever the case may be, but I think you got to look professional. And I see, I, I, I just watch the industry and it's just amazing to me that people are putting themselves forward to the consuming public looking like 
um, the guy that maybe is going to wash my windshield at the intersection, not somebody who I'm going to trust on a $700,000 transaction. Yeah, no, it, it all, it all matters. And I just want to remind people, especially with digital influence and digital leadership, uh, you know, it's things like, you know, Brian and I are both intentional about what's behind us. You know, we were both intentional on our lighting. You know, you can see our eyes. I mean, we both wear glasses, um, but you can see our eyes. There's enough light to now, see look, your if eyes. You look, and, look at my glasses, you'll see the light ring above yeah, me. Yeah, and that's that's because he wants to have influence. He wants to have trust and and he's building his brand. And you notice that like we don't, you know, we're not in our chair where we're all scrunched down and it looks like we're in the little chair, you know, like like this, right. you know, right. like the frame is level. You know, your your presence and your leadership matters. Look, I occasionally have a hat on because that's my corporate logo. I got a couple of different color hats. What I'm not is this guy. Hey, man, I want to be able to do your mortgage for you. Well, time out, time out, time out. I'm not, I'm going to, let's wrap this up because I know you got to jump on our meeting, but whatever your authentic brand is, just be intentional about it. I know some guys that wear their hat on backwards I got it. are closing okay, $200 million a year. My opinion. My opinion is no, I, I know, I know, but I, I think it's it's about being a pro. Yeah. And I right. and I do think you can be a pro with your hat on backwards. Uh I know you don't, but but, no, no, but, I think you but be intentional, be a pro. Be a pro. Right. All right, yes. my man. I appreciate you, Brian. Can't wait till Thanks, the next David. time we do as this. Always, I, as always, I look forward to doing these with you every month. All right. See you guys. Oh, and if you have questions next time, put those down below. Brian and I will get to them. And if you put them in um comments, whether you're watching this live, well, you're not watching this live, you're watching this on YouTube, put the questions 